Pluristem is a fascinating company. It's one that I've covered for a couple of years. Certainly an allogeneic leader. Zami and I often talk about Pluristem, and I talk about it as a mini mesoblast. Pluristem has raised capital, has actually a probably the most capital and cash in the company's history so far. But what I really like about Pluristem is the fact that this company has put a huge emphasis on manufacturing and is able to manufacture uh, different flavors, different formulations of their allogeneic stem cell therapy. So I look forward to Zami's presentation and hopefully a couple of minutes of Q&A at the end. Thanks, Zami. Thank you. And uh, I hope that I will try to cover the pluralism story in the next 10 minutes or so, so we'll have a few minutes for a question. So we are the placenta guys, and we are concentrating solely on placenta cells. That's our business, and what we believe is a good source for cell therapy. So we are a public company traded in uh, Tel Aviv and in NASDAQ, and I mentioned Tel Aviv before because it's common knowledge that NASDAQ, you have higher volume than in Israel, but uh, in our case, it's other way around. So we have larger, number and larger volumes in Israel from the trade point of view, and then uh, in NASDAQ. Uh, I think that we are the one that uh, pioneered the use of intramuscular administration of cells and receiving a systemic effect. It's important, and I will try to cover it later on while, I, while I'll bring a few examples. We have in-house manufacturing, and at least in the allogeneic space, we are the only company that it's a, has its own manufacturing. We have about 130 employees. So let's start with the cycle of life of our product. So following birth, within four hours, we'll bring the placenta, the placenta to our facilities, and we'll start to process them. Uh, it's manufactured in state-of-the-art facility that I will describe later, the facility design have been certified by the FDA and by EMA, the European agency, so we are sure that we can be good when we'll be at marketing. And then about eight weeks after delivery, cells are stored ready to go. They are stored in vials, not in bags, and I'll explain shortly why it's so important. One thing that we discovered in our phase one study is that one of the key element that may influence the quality and consistency of clinical studies is the way you prepare the cells for injection. As you're probably aware, the way it is done, you, put, you take the bag with cells, put it in a water bath, 37 degree, keep them for a while, and then take them for injection. And we find out that this process may cause some difficulties in the consistency of the study. So we took a decision to develop our own towing device, so the physician receives the cells, put them in the device, and within six minutes, he has the cells ready to go in the right temperature. And then cells can be injected, and the use of the placenta have been proven in a variety of studies. So which, in, uh, which indications we are in? So the first one is the cardiovascular. We have a few programs in that space. We are proud to say that the uh, FDA have approved an IC phase two study, intermolecular education, to best to our knowledge, is the first cell therapy product that have been improved for prevention and not uh, for a non-option uh, uh, patient. We have the orthopedic program. Uh, we do the study in Berlin. By the way, the IC study have been approved by the FDA, uh, by the German authorities, and uh, shortly in Israel. We have the hematological program, and the last one is the pulmonary hypertension, which is done together with our first client, which is United Therapeutics. Uh, we announced recently that the study had been approved in Australia for phase one, and that will be the first time that our placenta cells are injected IV to treat patients with pulmonary hypertension. You can see here the process, uh, and I would highlight a few, a few points, as, uh, as mentioned before. So we start with the placenta, which is considered as medical waste, we process them in the first three weeks as a conventional uh, 2D processing, and after three weeks, we have what we call intermediate cell stock. In this stage, we cryopreserve the cells, and now we can test the cells to make sure that the placenta is a proper placenta for uh, clinical use. And then when we decide that we want to produce the final product, we tow the one vial of cells and start the bioreactor processing, and in the end of the day, we have a product. 
The product today is the product names are PLXPAD for peripheral artery disease and RAD for radiation. So we can take the same placenta and have two different products by changing the processing, which I'll elaborate later on. In order to do so, we had to develop unique uh, equipment because what we find out that if one is willing to have a, a massive manufacturing of cells, you have to develop unique products that will enable us to do the manufacturing as needed, so we develop them across the board. So why it's so important to use 3D? In 3D, what we mean in 3D is that we have a 3D scaffold, we culture the cells on the 3D scaffold, and then the proliferation of the cells is done in, inside the bioreactor. And it's very important when, when you think about large-scale manufacturing, because in the beginning, if you think about small quantities of cells, 10, 20, 30 patients, you can use five-liter bioreactor, which is equivalent to about 70 multi-10 trays that you see in the picture. Sound reasonable. But if you go to a larger bioreactor, 15-liter bioreactor, it's equivalent to 210. Still, one can say we can go to Singapore or another destination in order to have Low, a low labor cost in order to produce such product. But think about real manufacturing when we talk about 75 liter bioreactor, which is equivalent to 1,500 multi 10 petri dishes. In that case, it will be very difficult to have consistency in production. For one bioreactor of 75 liter, we can, t we can have about 100 billion cells, which are equivalent to 1,000 doses of, uh, of, uh, of product instead of having the same manufacturing in, uh, in using uh, the multi-trays. Multi so we started our, we are located in Haifa, you can see a view of our location. So we started in, uh, we, with our first facility to manufacture the cell for phase one and phase two. And then recently we moved to the phase, uh, to the new facility which enabled us to produce the product for phase three and marketing. And you can see a few snapshots of the facility. We have global distribution. We have an agreement with the uh, Fisher uh, Bioservices, which gave us the ability to distribute the cells around the world. So what we do when we finish manufacturing, we deliver a few hundred of doses to one of the uh, Fisher Bioservices centers around the world. And then whenever clinical study is done, cells are delivered to the, to the site from the centers. We have uh, 22 granted patents and about 95 new applications covering a variety of areas in that. And now I, I would like to emphasize on the main topic of my, uh, my speech today is the question that everyone is asking, do PLX cells have to reach the target organ? We have heard of the cardio applications, the cardio experience that have been presented by my colleagues, and in most of the cases people claim that you have to inject the cells into the myocardium in order to have the effect. And then the question is, is it true? Because I think that there is an agreement today that the mechanism of action in cell therapy, at least most of the audience here agree, that the mechanism of action is achieved by the secretion of a variety of factors that can generate endocrine paracrine effect and to generate a curing effect or self-curing effect as a patient body. So if that is true, why you have to go to the target? You can inject the cell somewhere in the body and then they can react to the signal they receive using the blood system as a delivery system of signals and proteins that are produced by the cells later on. So we have tried to prove it first in, a, in animal models and later on in human uh, studies, and I will try to emphasize on that. So the first study is the classical HLI, a Heinlein ischemia model. You inject the cells. Sorry. Uh, I jumped with my... So the first model was the acute radiation syndrome. We injected the cells after irrigating the animals, and we injected the cells IM, intramuscular, generating a systemic effect, survival of animals, and when, when we have analyzed the hematopoietic system, we have seen an increase in the three blood lineages. And remember, IM administration after uh, irradiation, generating a systemic effect and recovery of the hematopoietic system of the animals. And then we move to another study, in which we use a classic HLI study. And we started, as usual, as, as you have seen today, injecting the cells into the operated limb. 
So that was the first study, and you can see the IAM, the, the, the red line, which represent the, the animal that received the cells intramuscular on the operated leg. And then we took a decision to move to the non-operated leg. You see the, the line in blue. And then we, uh, we moved one step further, and we took a decision to inject the cell subcute. And look on the data here. You can see here that three different injections into the operated limb, into the non-operated, subcute, give similar effect. Same animal model, same cell, same batch, everything is the same. So what does it give you a, a, a hint here? That if we agree philosophically that in cell therapy, the secretion profile of the cells define the therapeutic effect, then you don't have to inject the cells into the target organ. You have to inject them into a place where they can stay for a def defined time and secrete, communicate and secrete the uh, cytokines that are needed. And the best evidence to that is three patients that we, are treat we treated under compassionate use program in Israel. We injected PLX cells IM and generated a re nice recovery of the hematopoietic se uh, system of those patients that undergo unsuccessfully bone marrow transplantation, and we managed to inject the cells about two months after the failure of the transplantation, and we managed to uh, resecure those patients from death and extended the life of the free patient in an average of about seven months. And that's the team that helped me to do what I've mentioned before. Thank you. So, Zami, I'm going to try to get a series of questions off pretty quick. Um, just to segue from the prior presentation, Dr. Bernstein was talking a lot about the benefits of autologous therapy and why certain things fail, and he highlighted safety as well as efficacy. Um, so help me understand, what's the safety proposition or the immunogenicity associated with an allogeneic therapy that comes from the placenta? First of all, uh, I don't know if there is an issue, because if you look on the allogeneic studies, done by all, all our colleagues, there is no report on safety issues on all the allogeneic studies that have been reported until now. So probably it's a good selling speech for the autologous settings that if you inject autologous cells, then you eliminate the safety issues, but there's no safety issues with the MSCs. That's the fact. No report on safety issues. Regarding the placenta, uh, we managed to demonstrate in the early beginning that we can inject the placenta without any match. Not only that, in the first study conducted, uh, the phase one study in the CLI, we injected placenta cells from the same donor two weeks apart, and we had a comprehensive immunological testing of those patients, and we demonstrated that even the second administration does not generate the memory T cells to react against, uh, against them. So I think we have clear evidence that there is no safety issues in MSC, allogeneic MSC injection. Great. And, and what I hear you saying, too, is that the placenta may be a unique source of cells, and then there may be some immunoprivilege associated with them. That, that's correct, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about Pluristem has a partnership with United Therapeutics, and I believe you recently had some news. Can you just share with us what that was? As I mentioned in my presentation, our philosophy is to inject the cells IM, not IV. But we had a partner, United Therapeutic, which insists on injecting the cells IM, IV, sorry, understanding that probably the fact that the cells should be trapped in the lung after injection may generate a therapeutic effect because the cells will stay in the lung for a while and then can help the pulmonary hypertension patient that they are treating. So, you know, as a patient, as a customer is the king and whatever they want we are trying to do, so we cut a deal with them. And we supported them in the IV studies. We did a, a full bunch of uh, IV safety studies to approve that the cells can be administered IV. And recently we announced that they, are, they received the permission of the Australian authorities. And we hope to convince them in the future that they can start to treat patient IM, even though we're talking about pulmonary hypertension. But the first step will be IV, and later on we will move hopefully to IM. 
And I know that you're, I'd like to ask you to just take a moment and summarize the current clinical trials. I believe you're currently in a clinical trial in Germany for around muscle repair associated with hip replacement. So I'd like you to just kind of touch on that for me and help me understand what you're thinking about CLI given all of the changes that we've seen in the CLI landscape recently. We started with CLI, and as you know, the only endpoint that uh, accepted by the FDA is AFS, amputation-free survival. Uh, we did the phase one study, 27 patients, quite good results. But as you have seen from my presentation, we find out that not necessarily one should inject the cells into the affected limb. Probably you can inject them to other places. So we are trying to convince the agencies, the FDA and the other authorities, that we can do the study in a different way, not to inject the cells IM into the affected limb, but to inject them, distribute the cells in, uh, in other muscles in the, in the organ, and then to move into that study. Not only that, what we discovered with the CLI study, that as long as you go into that study and you analyze the, uh, the patient condition, if they have less, a less wound, they react better to the drug. So what we, uh, we conclude that we should interfere earlier than later because if you, uh, if you interfere too late, it's too late. So we managed to demonstrate to the FDA our finding and that the fact that uh, allows them to approve the intermuclear education study, which is running now in US, Germany, and shortly in Israel. We will enroll 150 patients, uh, three different doses uh, of treatment and one placebo, and then we'll have the decision how to move to the next step. Sami, thank you so much for coming.